Essentials of Faith Alone Part 3 Next, in saying the Nambutsu, you should possess the three minds. With the simple saying of the name, who cannot obtain the virtue, of one or ten utterances. Nevertheless, those who attain birth, are, exceedingly rare. The reason being that people do not have the three minds. The Contemplation Sutra states, The person with the three minds, will be born without fail, in that land. Shantau says in his commentary, If one possesses these three minds, one will unfailingly attain birth. If one of these minds is lacking, then birth is not attained. This means that, if a person lacks one of the three minds, he cannot be born. Although there are many, who say the name of Amida, in this world, rare are those, who actually attain birth. Know that this is because they do not possess the three minds. Concerning these three minds, first is the mind of sincerity. This is the true, and real heart, and mind. In entering the Buddha path, one must first of all have a sincere mind. If the mind is not sincere, it is impossible to advance. Amida Buddha, in the past accomplished the Bodhisattva practices, and established, the Pure Land. In doing this he awakened the sincere mind. Hence, if you desire to be born in that land, you must also awaken a sincere mind. As to this true, and real heart, and mind, one must abandon that, which is untrue, and unreal, and manifest that, which is true, and real. Indeed, although we are without, profound aspiration, for the Pure Land, on meeting others we talk as though, we have deep aspirations. While being deeply attached within, to fame, and gain, in this life. Our outward show, is a rejection of this world. While on the surface we act as though we have a good heart and are noble, we have within an evil heart, and a self-indulgent heart. This is called, a heart, and mind, which is empty, and transitory. Opposite of the true, and real heart, and mind. You should turn away from this, and firmly grasp the true, and real heart and mind. A person, who erroneously grasps this, saying that, if all things are not, as they seem to be, they might, as well be, empty, and transitory, exposes to others, even what, should be matters of reserve, and shame, and, contrarily, invites the faults of self-indulgence, and shamelessness. Concerning the true, and real heart, and mind, in seeking the pure land, rejecting this defiled world, and entrusting to the Buddha's vow, one must have such a heart, and mind. It does not necessarily mean, to openly manifest shame, or, to make a show of one's faults. You should deeply reflect on this in all circumstances and on all occasions. Shantau's commentary states, Do not express, outwardly, signs of wisdom, goodness, or diligence, while inwardly, possessing falsity. Second, is deep mind, the mind of trust. You should first know, the features of the mind of trust. The mind of trust is, to have deep faith in people's words, without doubting them. For example, suppose that a man, whom one deeply trusts, and of whom, one has no cause for suspicion whatever, tells you about a place, which, he knows well at first hand, saying that, there is a mountain here, a river there. You believe deeply, what he says, and, after you have accepted these words, you meet other people, who say it is all false. There is no mountain, and no river. Nevertheless, since what you heard, was said by a person, whom you cannot think, would speak a mere fabrication. A hundred thousand people, might tell you differently, but you would not accept it. Rather, you deeply trust what you heard first. This is called trust. Now, believing in what Shakyamuni taught, 
entrusting yourself to a meter's vow, and being without any doubt, should be like this. There are two aspects, concerning this mind of trust. The first is to believe oneself, to be a foolish being, of defiled karma, subject to birth and death, from incalculable kalpas past, constantly sinking, and, constantly turning, without any condition that could lead to liberation. The second is to believe deeply and decisively that, since one, does not doubt, that Amida's 48 vows, grasp sentient beings. One rides on the power of that vow, and will without fail attain birth. People often say, not that I don't believe in Buddha's vow. But when I reflect on myself, I see that my karmic hindrances have accumulated greatly, and that, the appearance, of a good heart, is rare. My mind is ever distracted, and single-mindedness, is impossible to achieve. I am forever negligent, and lack diligence. Although the Buddha's vow is said to be profound, how can the Buddha possibly receive me? Such thoughts, appear truly sensible. Arrogance, is not aroused, and self-conceit non-existent. Yet, there is the crime, of doubting the inconceivable power, of the Buddha. Does one know, what power, the Buddha possesses, when one says, that because of one's karmic evil, it is impossible to be saved. Even those wrongdoers, who commit the five grave offenses, because of ten utterances, attain birth in an instant. Even more so, those who never go, so far as, to commit the five grave offenses. And, in merit, far surpass that of ten utterances. If karmic evil is deep, all the more aspire for the land of bliss. It is said, not rejecting, those who break precepts, and, whose evil karma is profound. If your good, is slight. Think even more on Amida. It is said, with but, three, or, five utterances. The Buddha comes to welcome us. Do not meaninglessly despise yourself. Weaken your heart. And, doubt the Buddha's wisdom, which surpasses conceptual understanding. Suppose, that, there is a man, at the bottom of a tall cliff, unable to climb it. But there is a strong man, on the cliff above, who lowers a rope, and, thinking to have the man, at the bottom, take hold of it. Tells him, he will draw him up, to the top. However, the man at the bottom, holds his arms back, and, refuses to take the rope. Doubting, the strength of the man pulling, and, fearing that the rope is weak. Thus, it is altogether impossible, for him to climb, to the top. If he unhesitatingly, followed the man's words, stretched out his hands, and, grasped the rope, he would be able to climb at once. It is difficult for people, who doubt the Buddha's power, and, who do not entrust themselves, to the power of the vow, to climb the cliff of enlightenment. One should, simply put out the hand of trust, and, take hold of the rope of the vow. The Buddha's power, is without limits. Even the person, deeply burdened, with karmic evil, is never too heavy. The Buddha's wisdom is without bounds. Even those, whose minds are distracted, and self-indulgent, are never rejected. The mind of trust alone, is essential. There is no need to consider anything else. When trust, has become settled, the three minds, are naturally possessed. When the entrusting, to the primal vow, is true, and sincere, there is no heart empty, and transitory. When there is no doubt, in the anticipation, of one's birth, in the pure land, there arises the thought, of directing merit toward it. Hence, although the three minds, seem to differ, from each other, they are all included in the mind of trust. Third, is the mind, aspiring to be born, in the pure land, through directing merit. The term, is self-explanatory. 
therefore, I need not explain it in detail. It is to turn over the merit, of the three modes of action, of the past, and present, and to aspire, to be born, in the land of bliss.